Welcome to GVN's Talking Comics. Here is your host, Martin Sexton. Welcome once again to another edition of GVN's Talking Comics. I am your host, Martin, and today we are talking to renowned comic writer Scott Snyder. Scott is co-creator and writer of Noctera, which comes out on March 3rd by Image Comics. And for those of you who don't know, Noctera is probably one of the most highly anticipated titles coming in in the first quarter of 2021, and is coming off the heels of a very successful Kickstarter campaign, which uh, we will also talk about. So let's welcome Scott Snyder to GVN's Talking Comics. How are you doing today, Scott? Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate you uh, making the time. Not a problem with that. I got to tell you that when I realized I was going to have this opportunity, I was really excited because uh, I've been following this since the Kickstarter. Okay, so before we dive into Noctera, uh, I noticed something that when I was doing some research uh, before our interview, that you had worked uh, for a year early on for Walt Disney World. Well, since my son, who's 18 and severely autistic, uh, loves Disney World, I thought I'd ask you, and you had said at the time that uh, it had really had an impact on your writing. So, uh, how so? Yeah, it did. Um, well, I think, you know, I, I grew up in New York City, and... Um, for me, I think if people think of the city as a place of tremendous exposure, and it is. You know, you see people from so many different walks of life and uh, just so many different backgrounds, and you're you're really pushed into a public space with them, and you, you learn, I think, so much about what it means to, to be part of a collective. Um, but I, I hadn't really spent much time outside of, you know, the city that I grew up in up until – college. And so when I was finishing school, my parents really wanted me, if I wanted to be a writer, to to work at a publishing house or try and, you know, intern at a magazine. And I had done some of that stuff over the summers when I was younger, and I just felt like I wanted to get out and get some experience different than my own. And I went down to Florida. I started looking for a job. um, And it, someone told me, you know, they'll hire you pretty much right away at that time, back in the in the late 90s, like 1999, um, before uh, before 9/11. So uh, I went there and I was hired right away as a janitor. <laughs> I worked as a janitor for a while, and I was a roller skating janitor, and then I was a character. I was um, Pluto and Buzz Lightyear and Eeyore, and uh, it was a blast. And I think what really affected my writing about it was the the kind of blend of of wonder and the uh, the kind of the the desperate need you feel as someone who works there to make it magical and make it an experience that inspires kids and families and you want it to be what it's supposed to be you know and what it purports to be and then on the other hand just the the kind of um, hardship that I think a lot of people working their face you know, both as minimum wage workers, people living in, 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 in Florida, which has a lot of issues in and of itself. And so it was a really fascinating time for me, you know, just in terms of uh, it being eye-opening both to the creation of, you know, uh, kind of magical fiction uh, and the need for those things and the, 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 the good in that. And also the, um, you know, some of the, 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 the actual labor and the hardship that goes into it and the, the ways in which those things can also wind up being predatory at times. So, uh, you know, it was really fascinating to me, the blend of like going on stage as they call it and making it this amazing <laughs> fantasy and then going down into the tunnels and, you know, knowing the people working there, being friends with people working there and, and, you know, seeing their real lives. So it was, it was a really fan- a terrific experience in many ways. Excellent. Okay. And I know my son will be <laughs> happy to hear about that. Okay, so now, Not Terra is not your first creator-owned project. Uh, of course, I think American Vampire might have been your first. Uh, it did, have you learned anything since American Vampire till now that helps you with Not Terra? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, American Vampire was just so intimidating because it was also my first comic series, like my first actual ongoing. It wasn't a one-shot or a mini and comics being all I ever wanted to do, there was just so much pressure, you know, I felt it to, to make a career out of it through American Vampire. So I didn't really get to enjoy the first arc as much as I would have liked to. I mean, it was a tremendous thrill getting to work with Stephen King and, um, you know, and just seeing it come to life. I mean, it was a huge joy. 
but I was just so, so worried about it not doing well or, or people dropping the book as soon as Steve, uh, Stephen King was off, all of it. So now I think the thing I've learned the most is that if you really have fun on a book and love it, as I came to on American Vampire very quickly, fans, there'll be fans for it, you know, and, and if you stay true to kind of what it's about and why it matters to you and what the purpose of it is, you know, for you as a creator and why it's important to you, then other people will connect with it, you know, even in ways that you don't expect. So, I mean, as a uh, creator-owned title, you can kind of have that control maybe a little more than you might, you know, working, uh, you know, for DC or Marvel or such. Uh, so I would imagine you could, you know, you, got, you can kind of keep it where you want it where, without the outside forces kind of uh, kind of messing up what you're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, when you're working with characters that are 75, 80 years old, all of it's built already, and the rules and the mythology and the core aspects are created, and your job is to bring yourself to it you know, your love of that character and that world and your fears and hopes and try and write through them with that set of um, elements uh, and, and show why the character is great uh, in the way that he or she makes you brave in the face of the things that you're afraid of. Um, when it comes to your own stuff, it's all built from you. It's inherent that everything is going to be something that people are coming to the book for because you're building it, you know, it's your imagination. So um, both on a story level and narratively, you know, creatively, but just like you said, structurally, um, you know, uh, commercially, all of that stuff is up to you. So if you want to make your book 25 pages, 30 pages, if you want to release it um, as one big trade, that's all your decision. So it's a very exciting moment, I mean, I think for for creators right now because there's such vast interest in um, create our own books, I think partly driven by the streaming wars, you know, the fact that so many different platforms are desperate for content and comics are visual serialized storytelling generally. So they make perfect storyboards. So things are getting optioned more and more than they ever were before. So there's demand for content. Um, and then in the actual readership, I think people are just becoming savvier consumers and having grown up in a world where the superhero universe was writ large on movies and TV, but movies especially with Marvel for 15 years plus, um, I think they're, they're, they're well-versed in it and they're looking for superheroes and, and, and creations that they can feel are their own. So in that way, I think there's just a lot of, um, a lot of energy and enthusiasm and excitement around the creator own world, the ways in which there's an influx of readers. And also just like you said, the way that creators I think are excited to take control of their own careers um, through their creations this way and make more decisions that affect um, the entire ecosystem of, of what they're making. Okay. So uh, because of the creator own thing, you, you started your own publishing house in uh, Best Jacket Press. What made you decide to take that on, and where, where did you come up with the name for it? Well, yeah, uh, jacket is a is a um, what's the word where you m m mix two words? A portmanteau of my two sons, my two older sons, Jack and Emmett. So that's oh, why I have cool. two C's. So it's Jack, Emmett, um, and then we had a third son after I made it, <laughs> named <laughs> Quinn. So I've got to figure out a way to get a Q in there at some point. <laughs> Um, but uh, the idea was to um, be able to, to make a, a firmer commitment to make my own stuff over the next couple of years, be able to also hopefully in the next year start to help other people publish their work um, through, uh, through Best Jacket um, in different venues, you know, help them make a book, let them choose where they want to physically publish it, um, but help fund it. Um, in different ways and guide it if they want. So uh, for me, it just signaled like planting a real flag and saying I'm serious about my creator own now. And I'm definitely still involved at DC and I, I'd love to, you know, continue in superheroes for the, for a long time. But I, I wanted to show that I'm, um, that I'm, I'm really dedicated to, to my own um, stuff after 10 years in the superhero world. So that's really, that's really the idea behind it. And it gives me the flexibility of working with any publisher. So 
a lot of people have, or not a lot, but, you know, some creators have a label at one particular publisher image mostly, but some people have one at, uh, at Boom or Dark Horse. For me, the idea was to do something that would allow me to work with multiple publishers um, depending on the project. So if one creator I'm working with wants to do something digital first, we can work with Comixology. If one creator wants to do something that's um, more direct market, like Noctera, we can work with Image or Dark Horse or Vault or so, you know, or Kickstart it. So it gives me a lot of a lot of um, a lot of flexibility. Allows me to be nimble with the partners that I have on the books. Well, and it also is a great way to sort of give back to you know to the profession that you uh, love and uh, and it's done well by you. Excuse me, because that's the one thing I actually I like about the way things are now is so many different avenues are open to creators who might not have been able to get their foot in the door at DC or Marvel initially. I mean, you can say you create your own stuff, and if enough people notice it, then you can get into some of these other publishers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think when I was growing up, so, you know, you, you broke in through Marvel and DC, and then your hope was maybe to do some small creator owned on the side just for fun. Um, and then Image, you know, changed that um, and became a juggernaut in the 90s. And then I think it kind of, there was a moment in the 2000s when it oscillated and superheroes became the way in again. And then in the 2000s, it felt like there was a real renewed um, energy in um, indie comics with The Walking Dead and then Saga and the Rise of Image again. And now all of these new publishers, boom, I mean, not new, but, you know, resurgent or, or new, you know, boom, Vault, Scout, a, uh, ABA. I mean, there's just a lot of really exciting um, movement out there. Um, and so, yeah, I think the the whole model has changed where you can make a good living or a living at least like doing your indie stuff without superheroes and superheroes, you know, if you love them and want to work at, at DC or Marvel, the way in is generally through doing indie stuff and getting noticed by editorial that way, as opposed to doing the reverse. Right. Okay. okay so you initially launched uh, Noctera through a Kickstarter campaign, which, uh, I thought was actually very interesting and it's up mainly because I've always been intrigued by what goes into making a book. And that's basically what you did here. Uh, so what made you decide to kick off uh, your book in that way? And did the response surprise you any? Oh yeah. The response totally surprised me, but I mean, the reason that we did the Kickstarter was twofold. One for the practical reason behind it. I mean, it was right or we were already working on the book for image. Um, and we, we had been um, sort of in the middle of the first issue when COVID really hit and um, everything shut down, you know, image shut down, diamond shut down. And um, we realized that uh, with no, not only no end in sight to COVID, but with people really hurting, we wanted to find a way of making the book both um, solvent so that we could work on it without having to resort to um, abandoning it and taking jobs at places that, you know, could um, could keep the lights on for us or for, for the team. I'm fine, you know, but for, for Tony and for, his, for the art team um, without them having to go to other books. Um, and also that would, would allow us to make the book regardless of what was going on in the world. And so we felt if we tried to create a campaign, this was the second reason, that was connective, that gave people something that was genuinely fun for them to – see and feel, would allow them to feel part of the team and like they were in on the collaboration and part of the creative process. And we didn't try and do all the toys or buttons or that kind of stuff, not that anything's wrong with those things, but if we designed a campaign around connection and connectivity with fans um, around the creation of the book, we thought maybe it would work. And so those were the two reasons we wanted to try it. And we were really surprised by how well it did. I mean, it allowed us to fund the whole book and then allowed me to fund the first few issues of the book I'm doing afterwards for an image called Chain. So um, it was great. You know, I'm trying to be really upfront about how we're using the money, both for um, all the art, um, the variant covers, and uh, and not taking anything from image. Uh, to, and also, again, like I said, using the excess, um, at least, you know, on my end for, uh, for Chain, for uh, making sure that I can – pay uh, Ariella up front, Ariella Christentina, and the team there. So it's worked out really well for us. And so I know that uh, 
when I first uh, heard of it, that uh, in fact, in fact, I just got an email notice saying that my copy's on the way. So I'm kind of excited about about that. <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, when I first saw it, actually, uh, Nocturna wasn't the name. Nocturnal, I believe, was the name. So what what caused you to have to make that change? Oh yeah, the it, basically it was just there were too many things that had uh, Ternal in them. Whenever we searched our own project, other things popped up. So it was it was a worry that. Um, it was it was just going to be something that would be confusion, and there was another comic called Nocturnals, spelled differently. And again, when we searched our stuff, other things would pop up, and so we just felt like it was early enough that if we changed it um, to something else, it would work better for us, and we liked that name better. We had thought of it right after we did the book plates, <laughs> so it was like, you know what? Let's use it as an excuse to change it and make it different than everything else, and and that. So it was it was it was good. All right. Okay, so for the three or four folks probably out there that haven't heard of Nocterra, give me your best pitch of what it's about and why somebody should check it out, besides, of course, the fact that, that it's got uh, Scott Snyder, Tony S. Daniel, and Tomea Mori. In it. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the, the high concept is that it imagines that tomorrow the sun just doesn't rise, or more accurately, sunlight stops reaching the Earth for reasons that are completely unknown. And the darkness that falls over everything winds up being much more deadly and spooky than anything we expected, where it changes any living organism that stays in it unlit for more than about 10 hours into a creature called a shade, which is like a monstrous version of, of what the organism was initially. So um, the world has become deadly and uh, completely unknown to us, and everything is shrouded in darkness. And so the story really picks up about 13 years after this darkness falls and follows a trucker on the roads of this new reality named Val Sundog Rig. Sundog is her call sign as she traffics in people and goods from outpost to outpost. And the only way to survive is to stay lit in this world. So people have all kinds of ways, like suits they make out of light bulb, you know, with light bulbs hanging on them or high fashion, high tech LED suits, or, you know, they'll even just use torches and things, but everything is about not letting the darkness engulf you. And so it's a big, fun, high octane horror series, you know, trucks and monsters and all kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of, uh, of villains. But, um, it's also personal to me in that, uh, you know, it's a book about the ways in which darkness, um, it's about a darkness that separates us and transforms us into things that are unrecognizable to each other in this moment. And I think it, you know, it to me at least, in terms of writing a book that I thought my older kid could read, 14, you know, it has the, it has the kind of um, the underpinnings of things I know he's he's struggling with, like, you know, being separated from friends, feeling like you're losing touch, feeling like right. the climate out there is making people angrier at each other, making people unrecognizable to each other, you know, different, all of it. So everything is, um, everything about it means something to me. And I'm, I'm very, very excited about the whole thing. And I can't say enough good things about Tony as a collaborator and just as an artist, he's easily doing the best work of his career on it. And Tomeo is just a beast. He's amazing. And to make a world that's Shrouded in Darkness looks so dazzlingly colorful. I mean, it takes real talent. He's a he's a true master. And even the letterer on the book, Darren Bennett, is a friend and a real artist with lettering. So really love the team. The editor, Will Dennis, is the guy who greenlit American Vampire for me. So, you know, this is a team that really enjoys each other's company and respects each other. And we plan to make the book for a long time. Well, of course, I said you're you're basically starting out with a lot of people's initial fear of, of the dark, uh, and I've always told my grandson, who actually still struggles with this a little bit, and the book this book kind of proves it. It's not the dark that should scare you; it's what's in the dark that should scare you, and that's kind of what's happening in this book. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's where the that was the that was the um, inspiration for it initially was. You know, I had a real fear of the dark as a kid and watching my now nine-year-old struggle with it over the last couple of years got me thinking, well, what if there was a book that was about the darkness being just as scary as you fear it is as a kid or even scarier than that? So um, it's really, it, again, it, it's a personal book on a lot of levels. So I'm very, very excited to, to have it, um, you know, stretching out in front of us for a while.
So it's, I mean, because it's, visually it's, it's breathtaking, really. Uh, of course, I've always been a big fan of uh, Tony's uh, work anyway. Uh, okay, so a couple other things before we close it up. Uh, needs to say 2020 was a difficult year, uh, but the one thing I found that was consistent, which is good news for me, were the comic creators. They were still always putting out new stuff, uh, and it kind of gave you uh, almost a lifeline to normalcy. Uh, and, of course, one of the things that we missed out but pretty much for most of last year because of the pandemic was the uh, comic conventions. Uh, did you miss going to the conventions? Oh, yeah. I mean, I now I do. I mean, I think right <laughs> – at the time, um, you know, at the time COVID hit, I was I had been to a lot in a row, and I was glad to take a break, even though I wouldn't wish any of that on the industry or conventions at all. I mean, but I didn't miss them at first. I think it, more is just concerned with you know everybody's safety and health, and glad that they weren't having them. Um, but now a year in, yeah, I was just talking to Jock and Greg Capullo yesterday about how much we missed convention seeing fans getting to connect with people getting to connect with each other you know i was telling greg i'm like i feel like the first convention we're all going to wind up in jail from partying too hard you know when we see each other um but uh yeah i i do miss them you know it's it's been a really interesting time i mean it's been incredibly sad and difficult and challenging and and you know heartbreaking to watch so many people struggle and and uh at the same time, I think, you know, it's it's forced us here in our house, I mean, into a different kind of proximity with each other that's also been very, um, I don't know, very eye-opening about trying to reprioritize on the other side of all this a bit, where there's so much about being around my kids more, being around my wife more that really, you know, I realized how much I'd been missing it. I mean, I'm a pretty hands-on dad and have I'm here with them. You know, I work at home, so I pick them up from school, but just really engaging in a different way, you know. So I don't know. It's been a really interesting year. I'm, I'm very, you know, dark in many ways, but uh, in, in so many ways. But uh, I don't know. It's got me thinking a lot about how to be on the other side of all of it, both as a creator and as a just as a person. Yeah, I remember see, uh, seeing, uh, I think on Twitter, uh, a picture of you and your son out in the snow, which was <laughs> that uh, uh, I love the wonder on his face about the whole thing. I said, uh, I don't have that feeling anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. He's so he's such a cutie that he was a bit of a surprise. And so we have a 14 year old, a nine year old, and a one year old. <laughs> so it's a big spread. Okay, so uh, do you have any new projects coming up, uh, perhaps in conjunction with uh, uh, Best Jacket Press or just whatever you got, anything you want to, you can talk about? I well, yeah, I mean, I have the the um, the book I've talked about a little bit, Chain, um, which is about the food chain um, reversing in a fun way, but it's a it's a very different book. It's more of a kind of um, lockbox mystery with characters in this kind of claustrophobic setting. Um, uh, it's almost like a play um, that's up at the up in Alaska. So it's I really during the end of the world. So I'm really happy with it. Totally different kind of book. Really fun working with someone who I'm um, really inspired by and who was a brand new collaborative partner in uh, Ariella Christentina. Uh, and um, more than that, I mean we're, we're going to announce a ton of books, a lot of books for Best Jacket in the late spring. Um, many of them are underway already with multiple creators. I just want to do them all at once like I want to announce all of them at once <laughs> so we're going to do kind of an expo in late spring and be like here's everything coming oh, in 2021 okay. and 2022 excellent okay so for your final question I always end my interviews with a hypothetical uh many gives me a chance or gives you a chance to check your modesty at the door <laughs> okay so it's a great career here, here's the one I've got for you okay they're going to create a time capsule that is being established to that contains the very best comic book stories have to offer and they come to you and say, Scott Snyder, we want three or four of what you consider your best work to put in this time capsule. What's it going to be? <laughs> Man, uh, I I don't know. They're all like children. You know what I mean? That's, so, that's everyone so, tells me that, and, and I understand that. Uh, well, American Vampire, I would, just because it spanned my whole career. And it's my – it's sort of the place that I think is the most me all around, you know, like – 
all the other series or aspects of me explore deeper than American Vampire in different ways, but it has everything I love in one place, you know? So it's, witches might be like a, a more penetrating kind of exploration of parenthood and that stuff, you know, but um, it has elements of everything I like. But American Vampire is like kind of a, like home base where right. it's kind of comfort food. It's where every, everything I love to, to work on in one thing. So that book, um, Zero Year, honestly, or maybe Last Night on Earth. I don't know, out of the Batman stuff. I, lo- I, love, I, mean, I love all our Batman stuff, but the <laughs> – Zero year was really a special moment for me where I wrote that one for my kids and it was a real, I'm proud of, of how we reinvented the um, origin there in a way that I was trying to at least make it about things my kids are afraid of now and as opposed to what I was afraid of in the 80s that was so well represented in um, Dark Knight Returns and Year One um, but <clears throat> in other books, but maybe that. And then... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so much. I mean, metal or Justice League or I don't know which is. I, I can't. I can't pick another one. Those you're are, you're you're a victim of yeah. your uh, of your repertoire. Uh, but that's that's fine. I don't think they're good. they would tell Scott Snyder that. Uh, no, nah, you you have to give us something. You give you give us what you want to give us, and then we'd be happy with it. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what. I thank you so much for your time, Scott. And we can't wait for next year to hit the stands. I believe what is March third. I believe is when we. We come out for your first issue. That's right. Yep, March 3rd. It's on Image Comics and through Best Jacket Press. And uh, we will be following along with interest. And we thank you for being with us on uh, GVM Talking Comics. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it, Martin. All right. You have a good day. You too. Uh Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Come back again for another installment of GVN's Talking Comics, 